I was sent an announcement recently to share with the community. I want to share it with you right now. Here is this announcement. Did you know immigrants boost our local economy, help offset population decline in aging, contribute significant tax dollars, and add richness and diversity to our culture? Support immigrants in our community by attending May Day rallies on Sunday, April 31 from 4 to 6 in Milan, and Monday, May 1 from 5 to 7 in Kirksville on the Square. For the past two decades, immigrants have suffered from an onslaught of negative messaging and press coverage with harmful and sometimes even violent rhetoric increasing in recent months. Rather than let this national dialogue define the perception and treatment of immigrants locally, Nemo Unified seeks to set a tone of inclusiveness and value where immigrants are concerned. These rallies hosted by Nemo Unified will celebrate the contributions of immigrants as we establish a welcoming and safe atmosphere locally. Please join us to show your support for our neighbors and friends. That was sent out via email, Facebook post, etc. over these last weeks, and that's going to happen next weekend. Next weekend, Milan is invited to gather from 4 to 6 at the Pool Amphitheater for a worship service in an effort to build solidarity, trust, and hope for today, there is much fear among those who are immigrants, those who are not white. And as I listen, I hear what's happening across the state. There are immigrants, many with their paperwork in order, who are not willing to risk traveling for it. the idea of running into any authorities is, is scary. I know uh, th there's a fellow here in Milan who is the person you go talk to if you want to learn about how to buy a house and you're not from Milan. And this person is no longer asked about how to buy a house because why do you buy a house when you're afraid you're going to be deported? Instead, the questions have become about where do I hire a lawyer in case I need one? Churches that serve immigrant population, populations, including Methodist churches, are, are struggling. I was talking to the lady who uh, helps direct the development of uh, immigrant ethnic churches in Missouri across the state and with the recent uh, change in the atmosphere around immigration uh, their plates have dried up because you don't tithe if you're afraid that you're going to have to buy an airline ticket to fly your children home if you're deported or if you're going to have to hire a lawyer. And so we need to talk about it because as you may have noticed we live in Sullivan County. Ain't that an interesting place to live these days? If I had asked you 30 years ago, do you think your pastor would be talking about immigration as a pressing issue, you would have said, huh? Right? But here we are. We are being impacted by national immigration policy. This week I was hearing stories about how the plant up the road here used to have get your new ID day. You'd walk into a room and be given your, your new ID. I, I don't know how much that happened, but I, I do know that uh, there was a significant percentage of the population here, immigrant population, that was here without their paperwork. And, and then a federal, po federal policy, who here has heard of E-Verify? Is that something commonly known? Yeah. E-Verify is, is a federally run program where employers have to check the immigration status of people they employ. And, and so E-Verify was put into place and so after E-Verify came in, the number of Hispanic folk in Milan without paperwork dropped off massively. Probably less than 100 right now. Kind of hard to get an exact number, obviously. But so the history of this town, as far as I can tell, is this town of 2,000 rural white folk who had a chicken plant, ConAgra. Then ConAgra closed and the pig plant came and that percent, the percentage started to shift until it was approximately half immigrant Hispanic and half white. And then with E-Verify, the Hispanic population that was here illegally has for the most part left and now the Hispanic population is almost entirely legal and the slack that created in the working population of the plant has been picked up by people who have come from Africa, for, from refugees. And so talking to Brock at the health department, his best guess is that in Milan there are a thousand white folk, a thousand Hispanics, and about 400 Africans. That's, that's Milan today. And so a national policy, E-Verify, has been implemented and now our health department here in Milan is about is writing a grant to hire a Congolese interpreter. <laughs> it's just crazy, right? Um, that is where we are right now. 
And when my wife goes to sub at the school in a classroom of 20, she'll walk in and there'll be three languages spoken and half the class will be non-Caucasian. Definitely more so as you go into the lower grades. As Christians, we listen to Jesus and what he has to say about immigrants, or as it was put in the language of, of Scripture, aliens and strangers. If, 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 you read, if you're reading uh, the Bible and it comes up to alien or stranger, what you need to hear is immigrant. And it's usually part of the refrain, the widow, the stranger, the orphan. But before we get into what Jesus has to say, I need to take some time, about half this, this time together, to lay out a few things. Any Dragnet fans here? They'll play up. Just here's your just the facts, ma'am, portion of your Sunday morning. I need to get out the fact where we stand as a nation, and to make it just completely clear, I'm, we're about to go into an educational interlude. I'm not preaching after right now. I'm going to make it very clear. Don't pass the plate yet. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk as Andy, who happens to be an American citizen. I'm going to tell you about the country that we're a part of. Let me share, you some, share with you some interesting trivia. Which president in modern times, since 1965, has signed the largest amnesty for illegal aliens? Yep, that liberal firebrand, Ronald Reagan, signed an amnesty for three million people in 1956. Or 1986. Which president of, since 1965, which modern president, has deported the most people per year? Yes, he earned the title Deporter-in-Chief. Yes, that conser staunch conservative Obama is the one who has deported the most. Right? There are lots of surprises when you get it, start wading into this. Another bit of trivia. Are more people going to Mexico from America or going to America from Mexico? What's our net immigration rate right now with Mexico? Is it positive or negative? For vacation? Or no, just people coming to stay, right? Right now it's negative. Every year since 2012, a million people leave America to go, Mexicans going back to Mexico, and only 870 come in. So we have been net negative immigrant from Mexico for years now, right? So there are surprises if you start getting into the numbers, and that's what I did this week. A lot of these numbers are from Pew, and as well as from a libertarian think tank. So these are vetted numbers that are accurate as far as I can tell. So, where do we stand as a nation? 26% of immigrants do not have their paperwork in order and are here illegally. One quarter. Now, of the people who are, who are here illegally, that one quarter, just shy of half of them came here legally to begin with. And so you do some math with that, and it's just no, in the high 80s. That's the percentage of people who come here legally to begin with. And, and then that leaves us now with 11 to 14 million immigrants who are here illegally. In a, in a country of 318 million, that's about 4% of the population. That 4% of the population is responsible for 8% of the babies. Right? 340,000 babies a year are born to illegal immigrants, people who are here illegally. <clears throat> and so they tend to come here. It used to be more for economic reasons. Now more people are coming to America. The predominant reason is to escape violence from whence they came. They're coming here for their lives. Um, our economy depends upon them on first-generation immigrants, whether legal or illegal, because they make up 5% of our workforce. They are doing construction in the south, service industries on the coasts, and manufacturing in the Midwest. No surprises there. And they do a lot, large percentage of our agricultural work throughout the nation. It is the assessment of economists from all over the political spectrum that uh, they are net good to our economy. An open letter from 1,470 economists was sent to the government this week. 
uh, to the president, the majority leader, the minority leader, Speaker Ryan, and minority leader Pelosi. And this is signed by uh, Jane, Jason Furman, the chair of Obama's uh, Council of Economic Advisors, and Jim Miller, the head of OMB for Reagan as well as six other Nobel laureates and, well, 1,470 economists from all over, all across the, the political and economic spectrum. And what they can all agree on, have you ever tried to get academics to agree on anything? Right? This is what they can agree on. They can agree that immigrants are net positive to this country because they are more likely to start the new businesses that we need, that they bring the young workers to all that retiring baby boomers, they bring in the diverse skills, the science, technology, engineering, and math jobs that drive our future economic growth. And so they encourage our political leaders to see that immigration is a competitive advantage for America. Now, having said that, there are very real concerns in, around immigration. There are cultural concerns. People to, who come to America, well, they're not American, and they're different. And that's a challenge. There's a diff differing understanding of gender roles, how government functions, religion, our, our Western hang up about being on time. We want to be on time, right? That, that's not shared by the rest of the world, the sense of what it means to be on time, right? And language, there is no official language. And while uh, you, for a lot of jobs you have to learn English, anyone here have, ever have to learn a foreign language? It's really hard. It is really hard. And so to come here and learn English is a challenge. It takes at least one generation to solve the language problem, not because the people who come here learn English, but because all of their kids go to school, and that's where they all learn Eng English. There are safety concerns. Yes, it is true that 19 out of the 20 criminals who perpetrated 9-11 were immigrants, but that is the exception that skews the rest of the data. From 1975 to 2015, there have been 11 people, immigrants, uh, attempt, uh, convicted for attempting or executing a terrorist attack. Two Somalis, six Iranians, two Iraqis, and a Yemeni. 11 in 40 years. Um, Crime, if you try to figure out whether immigrants are more likely to commit a crime, what you'll find is everyone disagrees. Some people say they're more likely, some studies say they're less likely, some studies say we're not certain. What I think that tells us is immigrants are people and some people commit crimes and some people don't. Uh, it is my understanding that in Europe, they, they struggle far more with terrorism than America does for a very simple reason. America has a culture and a history of integrating people, of creating Americans. In Europe, it is really hard to show up and move to Britain and become British, or move to France and become French. They have a problem with that, and we are much better at that. And what we see uh, worldwide is the greatest danger is not people trying to get into the country, but people who are already in the country feel alienated and are radicalized, is I guess the way it's described. So the danger is not people trying to get in, it's the people who are here. And the great strength of America is to integrate people. And so the way to have a safer America is to make sure that immigrants become American as quickly as possible. Now the law on this, there are three phases to the law on immigration. The first phase is simple. Show up and be a white male. That's how you want to become a citizen of America? From, uh, from 1790 until 1921, if you show up and you're white uh, and you stick around for a bit, you're good. Now in 1868 they added the, if you're born in America, you're a citizen, 14th Amendment. But they put it, there's an interesting exception. No Chinese. Chinese could not be part, could not be American because of the yellow peril, the fear of the, the California gold rush, all the people coming from overseas to work the gold rush. They were afraid that they'd buy up all the land. And so uh, if you're Chinese, you couldn't own land or become a citizen. And actually that was applied to Indians too. The courts decided that Indians were like Chinese and they couldn't become citizens. Very weird to me. In 1921, a quota system was put in. 1921 to 1965, here's how it worked. You take the number of people of British descent, you take 3% of that number, and that's how many Brits can come to America in a year. You take the number of Germans, uh, German descent, you take 3% of that number, and that's how many Germans can come to America in a year. And that definitely skewed American immigration towards Europe, but that's how it ran from 1921 to 1965. And now we're running under a, a, a system put in place in 1965, and here's how it goes. If you can work a job we need you to work, you can come. We cap it at 700000 a year. 
If you can work a manual labor job, we need you. Or if you are highly skilled, we need you. And we, we'll take you that. And if you reuniting families, if you're a family member in America, we will say you can invite your family to come and become an immigrant and join. That is. Uh, how we're running right now. We see a lot of the manual labor of immigrants. Uh, a friend of mine over in Kansas City works at Cerner. He sees the other end of it. He works uh, and he sees a lot of the people who are coming in with hot, uh, getting college degrees or with college degrees who are working the highly skilled jobs. American immigration is running on a system that is decades old. 1965. America was a very different place in 1965, wasn't it? That's how old our system is. And the most accurate thing I can say about it is that it's a mess. Oh my God, it's a mess. George W. Bush, in an act of great courage and, and leadership, tried to put together a comprehensive immigration reform, and his own party shot him down. A shame. It would have been a very good thing. Now there's my just the facts. Here's my analysis of just the facts. We need a reform, a change in our law to be more coherent and fitting to the needs of the American economy that handles immigration in a way that doesn't lead to a situation where 26% of the immigrants are here without their paperwork in order, here illegally, because it's illegal. And that's a problem. We should not be running a system that, A, is that it's, it's a problem to have that much illegal action going on. I don't think that reform is going to happen anytime soon, and I am scared of the example of Japan. Japan has a workforce that has been declining since 1997. Their retiree group, those who are retired, are growing. They are heading towards a time when they will not have enough people working to pay for their version of Social Security. But we have a real challenge here. They, Japan needs babies. And what Japan does a really bad job of is wel welcoming immigrants. That, that is the risk if we don't handle immigration wisely. It's not the fast crisis, it's the slow crisis. We can't afford to do anything fast about it because we can't afford to deport 11 to 14 million people. It ain't going to work. It would cost us too much just monetarily and it would cripple our economy. So we're going to have to deal with the cards that were dealt and the church cannot look to the state to handle this because the state well, yeah. So, have I missed anything? Have I misconstrued anything? Any facts, contexts? Have I whiffed? Is, is that a fairly good description of where we stand? Okay. Now, let me preach a short, very short sermon. The city and the schools, they have, they have done a lot of work to, to make this work, and I've been deeply impressed by that. We read in Deuteronomy 10, Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no more, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. Show your love for the alien, the immigrant, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Why should the people of God take care of those who are immigrants? Because they remember being the same when they were slaves in Egypt. We read this as a very practical concern, the advice given, the guidance given in Deuteronomy 26. When you have finished paying your tithe, know that your tithe is going to be used to feed the stranger, the widow, and the outcast. And when you go out to harvest your field, don't harvest the corners. Why? So that the stranger, the immigrant, the widow, the outcast can go and harvest it and have something to eat. It's repeated again and again. Exodus 23, you shall not oppress a stranger since you yourselves know what it was like to be a stranger. You were strangers and immigrants in the land of Egypt. Exodus 22, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. 
All of these scriptures, as you may have noticed, are from the first books of the Bible. When God has chosen the Jewish people, these are the directions about how the chosen people are to act. And so later in the Old Testament, when this comes up again, what is said, it's the prophets who are pointing back to this and saying, how are you doing on taking care of the stranger, the immigrant, the widow, and the orphan? Jeremiah 7, uh, Jer Jeremiah speak on, speaking on behalf of God to these people who keep on responding to social problems by saying, but we have the temple, right? Are you having problems? Yeah, but we have the, we have the temple. And, and he says, do not trust in these words saying, but the temple of the Lord, we have the temple. We you've got the temple. For if you truly amend your ways and your deals, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the immigrant, the orphan, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers. So Israel was designed to be a nation full of a people, the Jews, who were going to do as God told them to do, take care of the widow, the immigrant, the orphan, the outcast. We do not live in the same type of government, a religious monarchy. That's not what America is. And so we cannot take what God proscribes for an entire people and blanket apply it. It would be nice, but as we've, discuss as we've discussed, it's not likely that we are going to be able to vote our way to getting uh, immigrants and refugees treated with dignity and respect as a nationwide thing. Right? It's not going to happen, not at least in this time period. So I think what we need to do is turn to Jesus and see how he directs us to interact with people. What, what can we do? And that's why we turn to Jesus with the woman at the well. He goes and starts talking to her. He's offering her good news. And she ends up going back and telling people about this. But it's that last verse I want to start with. Because what, what, what we hear, just then his disciples came back and they were shocked. They couldn't believe that Jesus was talking with that kind of woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. All right, what type of woman is it? That type of woman. It's a Samaritan. She's from the north. She's a, she's a stranger. She's an immigrant. When Jesus first talks to her, she responds, how come you, a Jew, would ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water? For Jews in those days wouldn't be, be caught dead talking to Samaritans. Right? There's a real problem with that focus on ethnicity, upon the immigrant status. There's a challenge because, and we see it in how the disciples respond. They, they don't think you should talk to people like that. What Jesus does is he talks to a person, and he sees her as a person before he sees her skin color or her worries about her accent or asks where she was raised. He sees and talks and listens to a person. And that's a challenge. You ever talk to someone when, you don't, when there are social barriers, when there are language barriers? It's a challenge, but that's what Jesus does. And it's not like Jesus took his disciples to side and does the Three Stooges routine. Oh, la, la, stop it! Right? Beats them upside the back of the head a few times and they're good. And that's it. The church never has to deal with this issue again. No. Paul has to write about it in his letters. He writes to the church at Galatia. There, are, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free in Christ Jesus. He has to write this because they're having problems with sexism and racism and classism. Right? That's the challenges they're facing, and they're still challenges today, wrapped up in immigration. Immigration, whether legal or illegal, is not going away. It will continue to be a significant issue in our country and in our county. I have little hope that there will be a national solution or an adequate political response anytime soon. And so we are going to continue to live in this tension between how things are and how frustrating that is, and what we see called for when Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God. So I think the best way forward for us individually and as a church is to do what Jesus did. Always a good answer. Do what Jesus did. He treated a person like a person. I think we can do that. Treat people like people. And I think part of that is watching our language. People are immigrants. They have come here illegally or legally, but there's no such thing as an illegal because no person is illegal in their being. They're a person. They have done an illegal act or they haven't. But they are immigrants. They're a person. They're a person to sit down and listen to first. Right? We love our neighbor, whether that neighbor is the same color, same language, same background. No matter that neighbor's past, they're still our neighbor. And then we support our school. Oh my god, the work this school does. 
three languages. They've got to deal with so this school carries such a burden. They do such amazing work. Any way that we can support our school, its teachers, and its staff is an act of grace. It is an act of support. It is what we do as people who follow Jesus. Finally, to treat, do all of this and to try to build a community so that people not, need not live in fear. Right? Because there are people who are afraid in Milan today. We don't see it, but it's there. And I think one of the ways we can understand about it is next Sunday, from 4 to 6, there's going to be a gathering of folk up at the amphitheater. I hope a goodly portion of us can go up there and listen. Not because uh, we have to say our piece, but we need to hear their piece. It's part of being neighborly. I hope we can go up there, and, and it's going to be from 4 to 6. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people that speak. I'll be giving the closing prayer, and um, I hope to see you there. Because that's one of the ways we love our neighbor as ourselves. And I'm talking to you about it today. I thought about preaching about it next Sunday. Because next Sunday is when it happens, right? But I want to talk to you about it today because I want your second response. Is your first response always your most graceful? No, it's not my most graceful either. I've said my piece now. I hope I got it right. Eek. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. But I want to hear your piece. I want to hear what you have to say about this. Have I whiffed? Have I gotten something wrong? Am I missing something? What do you think? I want us to chew on this as a community, as a church, so we can think about it and not give it our first response. I want our second response. I want the response inspired by conversation and prayer and silence and looking around and hearing. I can't wait to hear what you all have to say. Amen.